Hey everybody, it's your favorite gentleman, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. You guys are in for a very, very special treat. Today we're going to talk about um, one of my favorite topics. It's a little bit unique topic, but we're going to talk about food, right? Food, but healthy, healthy ways to get around it. Um, because there is such a thing as eating too much. And today I have a true expert who's going to talk about us about eating disorders and why we suffer through them and how we can overcome this crippling and debilitating um, um, disorder that many, many Americans are suffering through. So you won't want to miss this special guest of mine. She's coming to the stage here shortly. Stay tuned. Stay with us. You won't want to miss one second of this powerhouse speaker. Here we go. Welcome, everybody, to the Gentleman Style Podcast show. Are you are tuning in to the greatest show on earth? And I'm Marcus Norman, your favorite gentleman, Gentleman Style Podcast show. And today we are bringing to the stage Dr. Christina Castagni. And she is a licensed psychologist and is recognized as a certified eating disorder specialist by the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. She graduated with honors, earning her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her master's degree is in clinical psychology from Pepperdine University, and her doctoral degree accolades upon accolades in counseling psychology from the University of Southern California. For the past 20 years, this incredible speaker and doctor has been treating patients with a variety of mental health diagnosis, supervising postdoctoral res residents and continuing to grow her private practice. She is currently a member of the Academy for Eating Disorders, the Center for Mindful Eating and the International Association for Eating Disorder Professionals. And she is here to help us get to a better place mentally. Please help me welcome to the stage the incredible, the amazing, Dr. Castagna. <laughs> welcome, welcome, doctor. Thank you for joining us on Gentleman Style Podcast Show. We're happy to have you. Well, Marcus, that was quite an introduction. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is amazing. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. You, doctor, did all the great work. You did the hard work. And and we need you. We are coming to you now humbly, and 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 we need to pick your brain for a minute here. So thank you for joining us today. But Americans, we, us, me, I'm a, I'm a point the finger at me today. Um, we are suffering from an eating disorder. Um, what's the problem? What is what is the definition of an eating disorder, and why is it such such an important thing that we should be paying attention to? Well, it's interesting. So. There's so much misinformation out there about eating disorders and really it there are illnesses and so many people suffer with them. There, people think it's about the food, but it's really not about the food. Uh, if you want to think about an eating disorder as a symptom of the underlying problem, it's really just ways people use to cope with underlying struggles. So um, when you talk about anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, the top three that we often hear about. Uh, it's really same. I had an eating disorder for many years, and that's really why I specialize in treating um, my patients who have eating disorders. And really, that's my passion now is to get the word out about what eating disorders are, what they're not, because they're, like I said, there's so much information that's wrong out there. Um, so if you want to think about for me, for instance, it was really, there was so much in my life that felt so out of control. I felt like I couldn't speak. I didn't have a voice in things. My body felt out of control. I felt like I was so stressed out with grades. So just so many things though. I felt like the one thing I could control was my food. And I felt like if I could just control my food, then I could control my body. I could control this. I could control that. And it seemed like on the surface, it was about the food, but it really was it occupied so much of my mind space. I was thinking about calories and 
exercise and diets and this and that and all this was occupying so much of my mind space that I didn't have the time, effort and energy to think about what was really the struggle in my life and what was really going on. And so from the outside service, it looks like it's all about that. And for many people, um, they use food in different ways. So people maybe turn to food for comfort or um, to distract themselves. So um, again, they can escape and avoid and numb out from the real life struggles they're dealing with because turning to food is so much easier <laughs> in a way, even though after the fact they may beat themselves up and say, oh my gosh, why did I just eat all of that? Why did I just do all of that? But what happens there is when they are beating themselves up and feeling shame and guilt, that again occupies the mind and distracts them from having to really think about or deal with the real struggles they're having. And so it just, it takes over the entire, their entire life and their world. Makes sense. And that makes sense. Right. And so thank you for breaking that down so delicately, doctor. And I appreciate that. Right. Um, she's she's a, she's a doctor for real. Y'all, you see how she just dissected that. She's like a physician with a scalpel and she's like a brain surgeon and she's in there and she's carving things up. But is it is it something that um, what if is it still considered an eating disorder if I'm eating like fruits and vegetables? Is that still or is it just hovering around the bad foods? Um, is that still a deceiving eating, eating disorder if I'm eating healthy foods versus bad foods for the body? So here's the other thing out there, right? So um, all food is food. And so that's part of what I first start out with my patients is really talking about these labels of good and bad need to go away, first of all, because that perpetuates uh. a lot of this eating disorder stuff is the eating disorder, we call it Ed in your head, Ed says, oh, if you eat this food and that food, like the diet culture out there, diet culture is so pervasive, we don't even know. So even the fact that you said good food, bad food, you've bought into diet culture right there. Um, and so many of us have, we don't even question it. We go, of course, there's good food and bad food. How could there not be, right? Um, people will say yeah, salad's good and uh, donuts bad and say, well, let's talk about that for a second. All food has nutritional value. And we all, when we eat food, it gives us fuel and some nutritional value, right? Because the whole purpose of food is fuel and nutrition, and that's it, right? We need food to stay alive. We don't plug in like a cell phone, right? And so whoever came up with these labels of good and bad is really interesting. That's diet culture. And we don't question it. We're just seething in it, right? Um, and so if you if you can get away with that, get rid of those labels, first of all, because if you eat something that you say is bad, now you feel bad, right? Oh my gosh, I was so bad this weekend. I have to get right back on track, right? I have to be good again. Well, that's that right there is the emotional connection with food. And we got to cut that first because now if you eat something bad, you tell yourself you're bad. Now you, food is not just fuel and nutrition anymore. It's says something about you as a person or you're judging yourself or you're judging other people because now they're bad or they're unhealthy. It's, it's an awful thing. Diet culture will say, you know, it places value on a person for what they're eating or how they look. Somebody in our society in diet culture, if you're thin, you're valued more. If you're thin, yeah. you're healthy. But this is where we need to break things down and say, wait a minute, where's all this coming from? This is crap. This is awful. This is so much judgment placed on people. And that can cause a lot of emotional pain too. This can lead to people dieting, um, doing horrible things to themselves and dieting is a precursor to having an eating disorder. So we need to cut that first off and really challenge those things. Mindset, shift the mindset. That's what I'm hearing shift that cultural mindset so thank you for breaking that down doctor um you, you you laid out that that groundwork and you laid that foundation for us um what does some how can someone first um recover from an eating disorder if there's if there is a, a actual cure um i don't want to say cure but mm -hmm. maybe is it ever fully possible for someone to recover from an eating disorder fully that's a great question. And uh, I have my own podcast and that one of the main reasons I started it was because there's this huge myth out there that once you have an eating disorder, you're always going to kind of struggle with it or it's always going to kind of be with you. And um, as someone myself who's fully recovered, I wanted to break that myth 
because if you even hold on to that belief at all that, oh, I'm always going to kind of have it or I'm never going to fully recover, that's really powerful. That's a mindset that that takes over. And so I'm sitting here as living proof that, yes, you can fully recover. And that's number one, why I started the podcast, but number two, also why I treat patients is because if I wasn't fully recovered, think about how awful that would be for me to be in a room with a patient and I would constantly be getting triggered or perpetuate that myth about therapists and psychologists that I'm bringing my own stuff into the room and making therapy about me versus them. That would be horrible. Right? So of course, recovery is possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Told y'all. Told y'all. <laughs> powerful, powerful, powerful. We have one quick commercial break. You guys don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be right, right back. Good day, podcast listeners. This is your boy, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I wanted to let you guys know that we will be rolling out a new feature and adding a join sponsor button next to the subscriber button here at the bottom of your screen. Once you click the button, it will display three membership levels. Gentleman Gentry, which is our entry level. Duke Duchess, which is our season level and the emperor and empress which is our most sophisticated level which you will receive unique perks and benefits at each differing level and gain access to our community tab we will also be sharing polls upcoming events and interviews as well as receive feedback from our sponsors directly your support helps me find new and exciting guests to bring to the stage live well, in order to get the higher end speakers, it requires, well, some, you guessed it, money. So thank you for tuning in to my channel. And if becoming a sponsor sounds good to you, then select the join button below and choose your desired sponsor level. Let's continue to grow and serve the future of generations of men and women to come. Love you guys. Bye. Dr. Tagna, and she is here on the Gentleman Style Podcast show, and she is breaking down an industry, and she's breaking down the stigma behind eating disorders, and she's teaching us how to live a better life and to get and to change that mindset, to change our mindset around the issues around eating disorders and how we can do better as a society through counseling and education. And she's here on the Gentleman Style Podcast stage to help us. Doctor, 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 I wanted to ask this very important question. So I perpetuated this cycle. I perpetuated this problem earlier on the show that diets are, are, are the, the, the mindset that we all hang around. There's good foods and there's bad foods. But do diets actually work? And are they a good thing? Oh, well, I don't want to say, are they a good thing or bad thing? <laughs> but do diets actually work? They don't. Um, and so I actually had a whole podcast about this because I was like, oh my goodness, we need to talk about this. So uh, how do I put this? People say, oh, of course they work, but I want to ask you something. <laughs> I always ask people this. I say, Look, if, the, if diets work, then you would still be on the first one, right? That's true. You, right? That's but true. people have been on diet after diet after diet after diet. And what typically happens is they're on it and they get so excited. They're like, look, it worked. And I'm like, okay, then if it worked, what happened? You know, they get so excited and, and everybody, if you take on a change, right, you change the way you're exercising or what you're eating, the body's going to shift because you're making a change, right? And so they get excited. They get positive comments like, oh, you're making this. And so they get kind of excited at first, but then what is it? A couple few weeks, or maybe even some people can do it for an extended period of time, but then they go off of it. Right. And most people, what happens is they gain the weight that they lost back plus some, because what happens is they've killed their metabolism down to something that, you know, they got, it, it got shot down to whatever low amount they were eating. And so when they go back to eating normally, their metabolism is shot down to what they were used to eating. And so they end up gaining more weight back from when they started. And so they go, uh Oh, I've gained this weight back. I got to go back on another diet. 
and so they yo-yo back and forth. It's a it's a that paradigm that that evil back and forth like oh I lost thirty pounds but I gained forty, and it, it's a it's a constant it's a lifelong battle. So it's a lifelong battle. So what is it? Do you actually you talk about this and you coach to this? What do you actually recommend? How does someone know? They have an eating disorder. How does someone realize that they they're suffering with an eating disorder in their own lives? And and what's what are some signs and symptoms besides food? Are there any other triggers um, that they should work on? Well, you know it's complicated. Uh, you know, there's not one cause or one main symptom of an eating disorder. Um, it you know it's it's really something that you need to get assessed by a professional. Um, and so if you're noticing in yourself that you are preoccupied with food all the time, if you are um, finding yourself feeling guilty for eating certain things, um, if you're finding yourself exercising and feeling in a bad mood if you don't go to the gym or exercise. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I have to work out today. And if you don't, your mood is altered. Um, if you are earning your food in a certain like, so somebody says, I can't eat this unless I exercise today, or I didn't exercise. So now I can't eat this, or I call it like negotiating with your eating disorder. So, okay, I had a donut for breakfast this morning. So now I can't eat dessert later tonight, even if I wanted it, or I have to be quote unquote good the rest of the day because I had something quote unquote in their mind bad earlier today. Um, if there's certain things you're doing like that, um, and if your mind is, I'll ask people, how often do you think about food in your body? And they're like, oh gosh, 80% of the day. Okay. There's a problem there. <laughs> mm. right? right. Um, it's occupying a lot of their mind or if people are isolating and not going to parties or events because they either have to a fit in exercise or they're saying, oh, I can't go because there's not going to be any kind of food I can eat there. Or they're afraid it's not going to be according to what they can or can't eat. They just rather stay home because it's safer. Um, or oftentimes, like I remember for myself, I would plan my vacations based on if the hotels had a gym there or, you know, I'd have to right. bring my own food there. I mean, if there's certain things that start happening where your life starts to get smaller and smaller and you start to fit in less with people because you have to just make sure you eat your certain foods or stick to your certain routines and make sure everything fits in. It's like your life revolves around your eating in your exercise that's true that's true i need to stop so so now right she's talking to me y'all so now i'm gonna stop sneaking snacks into the theaters because i'm i'm very guilty of that <laughs> i'm very that's i do that all the time so i'm not gonna do that anymore you know i'm gonna go to the movies and i'm gonna eat what's in front of me at the theater and i'm not gonna be jaded or slanted by it i'm gonna go see that film tonight so thank you doctor i appreciate that you're right I need to to stop doing that. Is there anything is the, is exercise can exercising be unhealthy because you just described me trying to fit in um my food around exercise and and kind of using it as an excuse to to say okay now I exercise now I can have that donut or vice versa. I didn't have that donut or I did have that donut so now I need to exercise. Can exercise be an unhealthy thing? Absolutely. Um you know, it's interesting. So uh, we talk about like, say, bulimia nervosa. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's eating um, in somebody's mind and a large amount of food, um, more than you would normally eat in a, a certain setting, like a larger amount of food. Uh, people will call it like a binge. And then purging is most people would think of purging as making yourself like vomit. Uh, right? But when we talk about purging, a lot of times people were purged by over-exercising and people will think, what? That's purging? And like, you think about it. If you are compensating for whatever you've taken in calorie wise in your mind. So you're saying, okay, I ate all this food. Now I've got to go to the gym to burn it off. I've got to go exercise to burn that off, to make up, make up for it. That's purging, right? right. Because if you are eating, it's not like 
the second you eat something, it stays on your body and it just sits there and you gain weight. But that's the fear of someone who has an eating disorder. It's like you eat it and it's like, oh my gosh, it's stuck on me. I got to go get off, get it off, right? We do use the food, right? We do use it for fuel. We use it to live. We use it for our hearts pumping and our lungs breathing and, you know, DNA replication for like a flood flowing through our brain for our brains to function. We use it. It doesn't just stay there, but there's this fear of like, I have to go get rid of it right now, whatever I just ate. And so exercise can become this compulsive thing where it's like people will, you know, sleep four hours and make sure they get the gym in because they have to fit it in to make sure they, they feel okay. Like, okay, now I, I fit in my exercise and now I'm allowed to eat today or they will skip school or work or events with friends just to fit in the gym because they have to make sure they compensate for whatever they've eaten that day or they have to make sure they earn their food. Absolutely. That makes sense. So that makes sense. I wanted to ask the question. And so <laughs> what, how do I help someone, right? I have a loved one. I have a family member. How do we not cause those triggers, right? Um, if I'm a friend and I, I have a friend that's suffering from an eating disorder, what are some things to never say to someone who has an eating disorder? How can I help them? How can I, how can I, you know, if they're, they're trying to do better, what can I say or do or not say to, on their path to recovery? That's a great question. Um, because I think so, oftentimes loved ones are so well-meaning. They just don't even realize a lot of the things they're saying are so triggering. Um, so for someone who has, has anorexia nervosa, a lot of times they get triggered if someone says, wow, you look so healthy. Um, that is a huge trigger. They'll go, oh my gosh, I can't look healthy. I need to, I've gained weight. I need to lose more weight. Or if make a comment about what somebody's eating, especially out at a restaurant or something like, wow, that's a lot. You're eating a lot or, um, oh, you eat like a bird or just kind of pointing out what they're eating. They don't want attention on themselves. Um, or if you say something to somebody like, well, I'm just concerned about your health, you know, um, for someone who maybe is, has gained weight or, um, they're in a larger body to say something like that to somebody like, you know, you sh really should watch what you're eating. I'm just worried about your health. That's very triggering for somebody because you don't know what somebody has going on for all, you know, they could have what's called atypical anorexia, which is most people don't know what that is, but they could be in a much larger body, but they're actually engaging in anorexia <laughs> behaviors. They're eating very, very few calories and almost to the point of starvation, but their body is much larger. And so to hear something like that, all they think is, oh, wow, I just got to eat less and less. And that can be very dangerous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's, that's huge. And so that is something we all need to be mindful of y'all. That is something we need to pay attention to because we don't want to hurt the people that we care about. And we don't want to make an already bad situation um, more, more difficult for them. Right. We don't want to make it worse. And so we, we want to work to, we want to work with them and not against them, especially as they grow and they develop and they figure out themselves. Uh, doctor, at what point should someone who struggles with food and body image work with a specialist versus a licensed mental health professional? When should someone engage and, and which is the right pick, right? When do I need a nutritionist? What's the difference between, you know, the two? So, um, I, I always advocate working with a specialist if you're struggling with food and body image issues. And the reason I say that is look in, in medicine, right? You wouldn't go to an, um, if you had cancer, you wouldn't just go to a podiatrist, right? You just don't. And so it's the same in mental health. If you have a very specific mental health diagnosis or issue, I always advocate to go to a specialist. We specialize as well, right? If you, <laughs> why would you not go to someone who really can help you with that specific illness or, or struggle? And I say this because I know my colleagues and they are oftentimes very mystified about eating disorders. They are very confusing if you have never experienced one or really don't know much about them. Um, oftentimes I will hear some of my colleagues say, well, I would just send them to Weight Watchers or here or there. And if you don't know the complexities of, I call Ed, <laughs> Ed in the head, uh, oftentimes somebody can trigger uh, somebody who has an eating disorder and it can, it can spiral them in a downward space and make it worse actually. And nothing against my colleagues who don't know about eating disorders, but it's, it's very complicated. 
and tricky. Um, and same with a nutritionist. That So in my practice, I'll work with a nutritionist and a primary care provider um, just to make sure, because it, it does affect the body. So to make sure all the vitals and they're medically stable, but also with a um, specialized nutritionist, because if you just have somebody go to any old nutritionist, oftentimes, again, that can be a trigger. They can put them on, you know, a, a what would seem like a diet or say things to them that would trigger the eating disorder. So to really have somebody who's sensitive to the eating disorder and the illness work with a specialized therapist um, is really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That is major. We have one more quick commercial break. You guys don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Stay with us. Stay engaged. We'll be right back. We got to pay some bills, y'all. We got to go to a show sponsor. See you guys soon. If you're looking for a reliable, professional trucking and logistics service, you've come to the right place. Musa Trucking is a veteran-owned and operated premier transportation provider that can help with all of your trucking and logistics needs. Musa is revolutionizing the trucking industry through strategic partnerships, the development of core personnel, and the use of cutting-edge technology. Our inventory system ensures that cargo ends up divided into the right trucks and reaching the correct destination. Our drivers are dedicated to transporting goods efficiently and safely. Contact us today to get started by visiting the website on the screen or by calling 757-756-5246. We are back to the Gentleman Style Podcast show. We have the incredible doctor. She's breaking down eating disorders. And she just spilled the tea on how we can trigger someone to actually have a relapse or, or make a situation that they're already struggling with by bringing attention to them and bringing attention to them just from saying a few key words, right? And, and, and unintentionally causing them to relapse or make the condition worse. If you missed that, um, go back, scroll back and check her out. She is absolutely phenomenal. And you won't, we, we, we have to do better. We don't want to hurt our loved ones. We don't want to hurt our families and Americans, right? Americans, we are notorious, um, portion sizes. We are notorious for eating. We love food. We love the burgers. We love the hot dogs. We love the cheese sticks, cheese fries. And so there's a way to go about it. And there's a time when to bring in a specialist like Dr. Dr. Castagna, and she is helping us get to a better place. Uh, Dr. Help me out here. I, I want to make sure I understand this. Is so is weight not indicative or BMI not indicative indicative of a, or a good pred predicator of a healthy lifestyle? Um, just because I may be bigger doesn't necessarily mean I'm living unhealthy or I'm not a, a unhealthy person. Right. This is such a great question. Um, first of all, I could go off about the BMI. <laughs> it's such a <laughs> disaster. I wish we could get rid of it. Uh, the BMI is the worst thing I think that ever came into creation. So anyone out there listening, please just don't pay mind to it. It's no, not a predictor of anything related to health uh, and neither is weight. Um, you cannot look at anyone um, and know if they are physically healthy at all. Uh, weight is not a predictor of health. They're not, they're not correlated whatsoever, uh, contrary to what people believe. Um, so for instance, I will give you, I worked at a hospital for 15 years and I can tell you the amount of people that were doing so many horrible things to their bodies to be in a smaller body that they were genetically not meant to be in. They were the most physically unhealthy people, probably on the brink of a heart attack or death at any given moment. But, you know, to the outside world, to our diet culture society, they looked, quote unquote, healthy, fit, amazing. And, you know, they, I would send them to go see a, a medical doctor for a physical because I knew they were very ill and I knew what they were doing. They were malnourished. They were not eating near enough. They were exercising several hours a day. And I, I knew, oh my gosh, this person is really 
at the brink of death. I need that to get an EKG for their heart. I need to see what their pulse is there just to get a full workup of labs. And they'd go in to see the doctor and they'd be asked questions like, okay, are you exercising every day? Yes. Are you eating your <laughs> fruits and vegetables? Yes. You're doing a great job. You look great. You're great. Fine. Go. And they'd come back and see me and be like, see, I'm fine. The doctor said I look great. Keep up the good work. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Because in our crazy diet culture society, they had the quote unquote fit body, but they were really sick. And I don't know if you've ever heard of like somebody who's like 35 or 40 and everyone thought they're the great exerciser and healthy and fit. And then they fall over a heart attack like the next day out of nowhere. That's the kind of person I'm talking about versus I've had other patients who everyone would be hundred percent certain they must be like so unhealthy. They must have high blood pressure and diabetes and this and that. And you know what? They weren't, they had none of nothing, nothing. And they were always the ones sent by the doctors. Do you have to go get labs? You have to this. And you know, physicians would be shocked. Like they didn't have high blood pressure. They didn't have diabetes. They didn't have anything. And they're thinking, why this is what they were shocked. It's like, because it's not correlated. <laughs> right. Right. Thank you for busting that myth and debunking that myth because so many times, and you're right, the BMI scale, I'm, I remember joining the military. I'm a military veteran. I mm. remember joining the military and just getting in there and they were like, oh, you're overweight. I said, what? I've, I've, I've been this weight my entire life. You know, I've, I'm from the Caribbean. So I've climbed, you know, I've, I've been very active, played sports, academic, run, track and field, all of it. And they're like, no, you're overweight. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. But mm -hmm. that's kind of like the predicator, your weight. As soon as you go into the doctor, they put you on a scale, right? I got to get your weight. I, um, What's your weight? What's your BMI, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you're overweight. We got to get you. We got to look at your labs. We, like you said, we got to look at your labs because, and, oh, just preemptively, I'm going to put you on this hypertension medication. Mm -hmm. I'm just preemptively, I'm going to put you on this blood pressure medication. When in actuality, this actually, this was actually my father's situation, but he was actually, um, his heart rate was high. But that was genetically normal for him to operate mm -hmm. at a high level. And so but they were trying to work against it and slow it down versus that's that's his genetics. That's his makeup mm -hmm. is for his heart rate to, to go that way. So thank you for debunking that myth. Uh, how does social media play into the way we view ourselves? How does the media play into how we view ourselves in that body imagery, doctor? Oh my goodness. I could have a whole, <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> oh, my Much goodness. time as you need. Much oh, time as you need. Gosh, this is something, right? So $76 billion industry diet, <laughs> like beauty industry, right? So who's filtering all this? Who's, who's sending us the messages and the images that we see and are constantly bombarded with all over the place, right? Even before the internet. I mean, it was movies, magazines, commercials, like, right? Um, they're, they're sending out these images, right, that are photoshopped and filtered and altered, right? Um, and so if you're seeing that, it's like, let me ask you something, Marcus. Like, how many supermodels do you see walking around on this planet around you? Um, none. Nowhere. I don't <laughs> Nowhere. But they're always on TV. I don't see them at the beach. They're never at the beach. They're never at... You know, they're always at Abercrombie and Fitch for some reason. For whatever reason. <laughs> they're always someplace where I don't hang out. But they're they're the most beautiful people on the planet. And I need to make sure even cigarette smokers, right? Mm -hmm. Most attractive cigarette smokers on the planet. <laughs> I can't find them anywhere, doctor. But here's the thing. Everyone wants to look like these images that they don't exist except for on these fake images, right? They exist out there, but so less than 1% of this population genetically can look like these women, right? And yet 99% of women are struggling to try to look like this, think they can look like this, but it's totally unattainable. It's unrealistic. And this is ridiculous. So the diet and beauty industry puts all these images out there and women feel inadequate going, well, I don't look like that, but if they, somebody looks like that, then it's possible, right? So everyone's feeling inadequate. They're feeling insecure. They're feeling not good enough. So guess what? The diet and beauty industry comes in with all these products and promises and things that go, well, you, you can do this just buy this product or just do this or Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or this or that. Like, just try this, just try this, just try this. And then what happens is people buy these things or they 
try these things. They put lots of money into them. And then ultimately they don't work. And guess what? The person tells themselves, I failed. So they automatically felt, they already, they already felt horrible about themselves to begin with. That's how they bought these things, right? And then when the products fail or the thing they bought into fails, now they feel even lower about themselves. Like, oh, I really screwed up now, a huge failure. Hey, guess what? There's another product down the pipe that they can try this one. <laughs> so it's hmm. this is downward cycle because listen, it's not a $76 billion industry because the products work. You have to have repeat buyers because if something works, <laughs> you get no more it's customers. a one-off, right? <laughs> Yeah, I fixed the problem. Whoops. Oops, right? So you have to keep pumping in these images of these unattainable, unrealistic images, right? That people can never achieve. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're so right. You're so, so, so right. Doctor, you have been powerful today. I thank you. I thank you for breaking this down so delicately. And I thank you for talking about this sensitive subject. It is a, sen it is a sensitive topic. It is something that um, some people struggle with privately. And I want to make, I wanted to, that's why I wanted to get you on a show to talk about it and let people know that you're okay. Get with a specialist mm -hmm. and we'll get you to figure out where you need to be. And if you're healthy, then you're healthy. And that's all that really matters. Are you happy with yourself? Are you loving yourself? Just like you said earlier, is 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 eighty percent of your mind and your day <laughs> spent thinking about food? Meanwhile, you know, <laughs> you're missing out on a whole world, an exciting, beautiful world out there. Mm -hmm. Doctors, how can my audience connect with you? How can we grow with you? How can we learn more? So I have a. Uh few places on social media. I'm on Instagram at behind the bite. And I also have a website behind the bite podcast.com. And I also have a podcast, which is behind the bite. It's on, uh, I guess, Apple iTunes and uh, Spotify and Pandora, all the major places where podcasts are. So if you want to hear all sorts of things about eating disorders and body image issues, that's the place to go listen and there's links to the podcast and my website and instagram and facebook and all that so absolutely absolutely thank you doctor for taking time out of your busy day i want to say thank you i appreciate you for taking time out of your busy day to help us me we get to a better place you are necessary so don't ever quit we need you we need what you're doing thank well, you so much thank you it's amazing you had this topic on so i appreciate all you're doing absolutely absolutely told you guys i love talking about food but this is something we need to hear right we need to hear this and so i want to say thank you all my audience for tuning into the gentleman style podcast show i hope this message has served you i hope this was helpful and i hope it helps you realize that you're okay and there are people that love you and desire you to be here and they're not going to beat you up about um food right and there's a better way there's a better tomorrow and you're not going to die tomorrow. So let's get some help, right? Let's get with a specialist <laughs> and do this the right way. Forget what your doctor said. Forget what everybody said. Forget social media. Forget what everyone else says, right? Let's do this together. Like I end every show, take care of your friends, take care of your family, and always, always take care of business. This is Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show and the great doctor signing off. Love you guys. Bye.